So, uh, so rather than um, me go through and um, in previous um, summits, I shared um, my story for um, uh, battling, through battling Castle and disease and deciding to start the CDC with Dr. Van Reed and to, to pair up and team up with Craig and the care group. Um, generally, I, I shared in the past this year, um, we were really fortunate to get some great um, awareness. The Today Show ran a story in early 2018 about the CDC and about what we're doing. Um, so I thought that um, rather than my long-winded story, I can give you guys a two-minute video um, that really shares my story. Doctors spend their lives killing other people. But what happens when physicians become patients? Who do they trust with their own health and their own lives? And what if the only doctor who can save you is you? Dylan shines our Sunday spotlight on a young doctor who's now specializing in saving his own life. Dr. David Fagenbaum is in the fight of his life. There were three flares over the first six months. To find a cure for an extremely rare disease. Castleman's is almost like a mix between an autoimmune disease and a cancer. It's just relentless in what it can do. He is fighting to save the most important patient in his life, himself. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in November of 2010, I had my last rights read to me, all because my immune system was attacking my organs. The 32-year-old doctor at the University of Pennsylvania was always the picture of health. A former quarterback at Georgetown University, David had never faced any serious medical issues. That all changed in July 2010. I went from being this healthy third-year medical student um, to being hospitalized in the intensive care unit with every organ failing, my liver, my kidneys, my bone marrow, completely shut down, gained 70 pounds of fluid due to liver and kidney failure, uh, and, and didn't think that I was going to survive. Intensive chemotherapy brought David back, but two relapses followed. Did the doctors know at first that it was Castleman's disease? No, it, it took about 11 weeks to diagnose me. With very little known about this rare disease, David took his treatment into his own hands. What I learned very quickly is that though I now had a name for that thing that was trying to kill me, the medical community had such a poor understanding for how the disease worked. His research led him to Dr. Fritz Van Riet at the University of Arkansas of Medical Sciences. So David started here as, as a patient. He became very interested in, in, in the research. Together, the two men started building a network, looking for solutions, <laughs> racing against time. And when you have a deadly disease, you don't really want to wait for the stars to align. Yeah. We prioritize all the possible studies that can be done. We go and recruit the best person in the world to do those studies. Despite the research, David continued to relapse. I turned to my sisters and my, my wife, and I told them, I said, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life, however long that might be, to try to cure this disease. Your blood work done this morning, Todd. Blood um, works good. Blood works good. But of course, it's like kind of always living, right? Yeah. yeah. With a disease that could come back at any moment, David became his own test subject. I started conducting laboratory research on my samples, going through all my medical data. I thought that a drug that had never been used for Castleman's before, called serolimus, might work. And um, I decided to try it on myself. It was a major breakthrough. He's now been in remission for four years. David says his perseverance was inspired in part by his mother's own battle with cancer. My mom was amazing and not just finding silver linings and problems, but actually creating silver linings. Um, to take a terrible experience and to create something positive out of it. And she instilled that in me. Anne-Marie Fagenbaum lost her battle with brain cancer. David's battle continues. This drug that I'm on that's saving my life, we've now tried it in a few other patients. It's helping them. So we're fighting with everything we have. Dylan, you look at some of those old pictures of him and how good he looks now. Is he totally healthy now? Is he okay? Well, it has been four years since his last relapse. So he had five relapses total. But the good news now is that he has enough data to take this to clinical trial. And for everyone who's dealing with Castleman's, I mean, if this is the road to the cure that everybody's been looking for, I mean, he's, he's the reason why. Well, that's the extraordinary part about it. It wasn't just curing himself. This is going to help a lot of other people. It really will. A disease that really nobody knows that much about. Very cool. Dylan, thanks so much. Great story. When Meghan Markle married Prince Harry, she Oops. brought the promise of the <laughs> 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 um, And then, of course, uh, I wanted to share my story, which that's that's just one part of it. And then this is the new part of the story. <laughs> 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 Warrior 
shirt flap. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my wife and I are so happy, and really this is, uh, I think it's so important to, to share this second part of the story with you guys that um, obviously during those ups and downs, um, I, I didn't think that I was going to survive, obviously, and I certainly didn't think that I was ever going to get to a day where I could have uh, a sweet daughter like this. So I really do have to, Amelia Marie, Amelia, Amelia Marie, um, and her initials AMF, after were my mom's initials. Um, so she shares initials with my mom, and um, she's, the, um, she's, the, she's the best. And so I just want to share this with you because I know many of you guys um, obviously are at various stages of your own battles and, and what you can kind of think about in the future, hope for in the future, and, and I just never even could have imagined this. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're going to keep fighting and keep working so that way all of us um, have great opportunities like this um, for major life events. So um, I now want to just take a step back to what we mean when we say Castleman disease. Um, Castleman disease is something that unites all of us. We either are battling it ourselves or we have a loved one with Castleman disease. Um, but Castleman disease, th those two words, really have a variety of meaning. Um, so when you, when you hear someone talking about what they have Castleman disease or what is Castleman's, Castleman's is really a group of diseases that all look the same under the microscope. So if you take out a lymph node from someone with Castleman disease, their lymph node will look similar to other people with Castleman disease. But it's really a heter heterogeneous and very different group of diseases that are all mixed into one. And it's kind of the same thing as if you think about cancer. If someone says, I have cancer, or I know someone with cancer, that gives you an idea for what they're going through, but it doesn't tell you what type of cancer they have, what type of treatment they need, what they're going through. They have cancer. So Castleman's is a similar sort of thing. It's a, it's a name for an overarching group of diseases, and we are really trying to nail down on those individual diseases that fall within this umbrella term. Um, this is an example of a Castleman disease, a, a small snapshot of a Castleman disease lymph node. Um, and, and we're not going to spend much time today going through pathology, as much as I guess you guys probably can expect that I would love to. Um, we'll, we'll avoid the pathology, but generally there are features that unify us. That if you look at our lymph node on the microscope, we have similar features, but we all have very different stories and experiences. Generally, you can break up Castleman disease into three major buckets, three major groups, and then you can even further subgroup it. But just to start, we talk about unicentric Castleman disease. You can see our, our guy over here. Um, this person has a single enlarged lymph node in one part of their body and maybe a couple other lymph nodes nearby. That's unicentric, meaning you need one region, one region of the body with these enlarged lymph nodes that look like Castleman disease. Um, as you can see, it's, it's, the estimate is that it's much more common in multicentric Castleman disease. Um, the cause is unknown, um, but generally surgical excision is generally um, the way that you try to treat um, unicentric Castleman disease. Um, and patients can do really well with UCD as far as long-term survival. I, I turned my mic off, sorry. I, were you guys able to hear most of that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so uh, the, the, the risks that you need to think about with unicentric Castleman disease, is, first off, most patients will never relapse if that lymph node comes out. And secondly, no one has ever gone from unicentric Castleman disease to having multicentric Castleman disease, which is important to keep in mind. Um, there are two real but very small increased risks. One is a slightly increased risk of cancer, and the second is a slightly increased risk of something called peridineoplastic pemphigus. Um, and, and these kinds of things we, we can certainly talk um, about um, later on throughout the day. Um, and then when we move from unicentric, meaning that there's about one enlarged lymph to multicentric. Multicentric means multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes. And one of the subtypes of multicentric is called HHVA positive multicentric Castleman. This is where a virus, the HHVA, the HHVA virus, gets out of control and the immune system spends so much time trying to kill that virus that it actually causes damage throughout the body. So it's the immune system's trying to fight against this virus, but the virus is able to evade the immune system. It causes the immune system to attack, um, to attack the body. Now, in this case, this, this often and typically occurs in individuals who have a weakened immune system. So if you have a healthy immune system and you're infected with HHV8 virus, you don't have any problems. About 10% of the whole US population gets infected with HHV8 at some point in their life. And if you've got a strong immune system, you're fine. But if you have a weakened immune system, either due to HIV infection or some other cause of having a weakened immune system, then you can't control that virus. The virus gets out of control, um, and then your immune system causes a lot of damage. Fortunately, treatment with a drug called rituximab um, is very effective um, in patients with HHV 
positive MCD, this virus, HHV8, lives in the cell that the, the, that the drug rituximab kills. So you kill the cell, you get rid of the virus. And patients generally do very well um, with HHV positive MCD. Things get a lot more confusing and a lot less well understood when you get down to what's called HHV negative or idiopathic multicentric calcium disease. Anytime you see the word idiopathic with a disease, that's not a good sign because that means we don't know what causes it. We don't really understand it very well. So this group, the HHV negative MCD group, um, you get the same sort of immune system going crazy, just like in this group, but there is no virus. There's no HHV and there's no cause of immunosuppression. Um, we do know that this one, you'll hear terms like cytokine say, this one cytokine, which is a protein that your immune system uses to communicate with other immune cells, is very high in a lot of patients with idiopathic multicentric calcium disease. But it's not high in everyone. And so we don't know um, what it is that causes IL-60 elevated in some, and we don't know um, what is important in patients who don't have high IL-6. Um, and we know that IL-6 blockade with a drug called siltuximab um, is effective in somewhere between a third and about a half of patients. Um, so we know in those patients, if you get better with siltuximab, then you can pretty well assume that IL-6 is the problem because you blocked the IL-6 and you got better. <coughs> but if the patients who don't get better with siltuximab, um, which is, as you can see, about two-thirds to one-half or so, um, we don't know what it is that's causing the problem in those patients. Um, and as you can see, there's a, a, a wide range um, of survival. Um, if you average all cancers together, um, so every cancer you've ever heard of, the average survival is about a 65% five-year survival, um, which is right about the average of what it is um, for castle, or for idiopathic multicentric castle disease. Um, but I think something to keep in mind, and something that I think about a lot, twofold. One is that every patient's different. Um, so a statistic doesn't define anyone, right? This is saying, on average, over the course of all these patients, this is what the range is for what a five-year survival is. But that doesn't mean that that's what it is for anyone in this room, uh, myself included. And the other thing is, is that you've got a whole team of people through the CDCN and around the world that are working to change this. And so, um, you know, these statistics can't be updated in real time. We're, we're fighting, we're trying to identify new drugs, we're trying to push forward research. And this number will go up, um, but it's going to take time for us to, to, for the statistics to catch up with the work that we're doing. Um, so I want to go through a little bit of the timeline, because um, this talk, this part of the, of the day is about what's new for Castleman disease. And, and to think about what's new for Castleman, I think it's helpful to look at what it, where were things before, um, before 2012. So Dr. Benjamin Castleman first described the disease back in 1954. Um, and then in the 1970s, it was clear that there were two different subgroups, kind of, you know how before I broke it up into three different groups? By the 1970s, they said, oh wow, there's at least two groups. There's the unicentric and there's multicentric. Um, and then in 1989, um, Kazuo Yoshizaki, um, who's a member of the CCN Scientific Advisory Board, he discovered for the first time that interleukin-6 was elevated. He only looked in three patients, um, or sorry, it actually was two, two patients. I mean, only looked in two patients, but he found IL-6 was elevated in those patients. Um, and then he began his life's work and his mission to better understand IL-6 and to develop a drug against IL-6. Um, and about 20 years, or, or I guess 15 years after that, um, a drug that blocks the receptor for IL-6 became approved for multicentric calcium disease in Japan. Now in this period, the 16 year window here, um, uh, I, I talked to Kazu about this because he's 100% responsible for getting from here to here 16 years later. And I was asking Kazu about the story for how he went from discovering IL-6 was high in some patients to a drug that targets the receptor for IL-6. Um, and one of his colleagues had told me that Kazu had tried the drug on himself. Um, and so I asked Kazu, I said, Kazu, I heard that at some point along the development, you actually gave the drug to yourself. And, to prove that it could be given to humans. And he responded to me, he said, no, 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 I didn't give the drug to myself, the nurse, she gave it to me. And uh, I said, that's what I mean, Kazu. Um, so Kazu actually gave the drug to himself um, as the first human to get Actemra. So some people in the room, I know Greg and I think others, um, have been given Actemra over the years. Um, that drug was first given to Kazu by, by a nurse, and, um, uh, and, and now, now it's approved in Japan um, for multicentric calcium disease. It's, it's not approved in the U.S. for multicentric calcium disease, it's approved for rheumatoid arthritis in the U.S. And then in 2012, 
Um, the CDCN was founded and we, um, we merged with CARE, which is a foundation that Greg started with his wife, Cheryl Lynn, uh, back in 2007. Greg is a calcium disease patient as well. Um, and in his fight, in his fight against calcium disease, um, him and his wife decided to start a foundation to raise awareness and research for calcium disease. And so when Dr. Van Green and I were working on the CDCN, it was a no-brainer uh, to team up with Greg and, and Michael and others um, to, to join forces and to, and to take a unified fight against calcium. So where were we in 2012? And so this is about 58 years after Castleman's was first discovered. So IMCD was pretty poorly understood. Um, there were different classification systems being used. Um, there wasn't really a framework to guide how to do research. There hadn't really been any systematic attempts to characterize IMCD. Uh, and IMCD is that third group, that idiopathic multi-tender Castleman's. IMCD stands for idiopathic. No diagnostic criteria, no code to keep track of the disease. Um, research was really uncoordinated, so um, though there was research funding being given out by CARE, there wasn't an umbrella organization that was saying, you need to do this and you need to do that, based on what the scientific community was, was recommending. So there was limited collaboration within the field, and like I said, there wasn't really that coordinated planning effort. Um, no drugs were in development beyond IL-6 and IL-6 receptor. As I said before, blocking the IL-6 works for about a third to half of patients with IMCD. Um, so there's other patients where it doesn't work. There just wasn't any development uh, being done. And for me, this was particularly um, scary and concerning personally um, because I had just um, had a, a major relapse on the, the IL-6 blocker. So the drug didn't work for me. Um, and, and seeing that there really wasn't anything else in development was pretty scary. Um, really a lot of unknowns about the disease. And, and a lot of the things that are generally needed for research didn't exist. Um, and, and no NIH funding. So for me, it was uh, really clear to take three steps forward. One is I wanted to start doing research. The second, I wanted to start the CDCN. And the third is I want to get involved with Penn's Orphan Disease Center, which is a, a, um, a center here at Penn focused on rare disease research. And I'm not going to go through the details of this, but we decided we want to take a new approach to research. So rather than raising money and inviting individual researchers to apply for that funding, we said, let's move the new approach. Let's build a community of researchers around the world. Let's figure out what's the best research to do, and let's go find the best person in the world to do each of those studies for us. And as we begin to figure things out, let's start trying to launch clinical trials around drugs that might be effective. Let's track what's working and what's not working through the registry. Um, let's try to personalize medicine. Well, what we mean by personalized medicine is that we want to get to a position where every single patient with calcium disease, no matter what subtype you have, has a drug that can work for you. That's our goal. We want to personalize medicine, you know, there's a drug for every single patient and every subtype um, with calcium. It's a drug that can save your life and keep you doing well and having like major life events um, like, like children. So the way that we try to get there um, is through um, four-step approach, or through four major areas. One is that is obviously the research. That's the heart of what we do, um, is driving forward the science. That way we can develop new drugs, new diagnoses, diagnostic tests so we can help more patients. Um, it's not research just to understand calcium disease. Uh, I don't think any of us really care about understanding calcium disease as much as we care about figuring out this disease and getting the right drugs uh, for the right patients. Um, before I go any further, I, I, I just wanted to um, introduce a couple people that just walked in. Um, so Carlin, Clarice, and then the third nurse is Marissa. Um, who are coming to help us do blood draws. They are the most incredible people in the world. They're not just my favorite nurses, they're my favorite people, and they've come <laughs> on their days off. You know, they, they had today off from work, and they're coming in today um, to help to do blood draws for you guys. So please join me in a round of So in addition to research, there's also um, physician and, and, and researcher engagement, which is in trying to create collaborations, and drive forward science, um, also connecting and supporting patients, um, and lastly, um, our raising awareness and fundraising. We're going to try to hit on all of these um, today. So this is a, a picture showing a bunch of the locations with physicians and researchers that are part of our network. Um, this is a picture from a couple years ago at one of our meetings, doing the Castleman Warrior Flex, the one that I showed Emilio was doing <laughs> Um, and then this is uh, actually a couple years old, it's a lot of data, but these are locations where there's Castleman patients around the world that are part of the CDCM network. So most of you guys are probably represented with one of these dots, but like I said, it's a couple years old, so, so you may not be represented. This is last year's patient summit. 
So that's kind of giving you the history. And then, so what's new today? Um, and what, what, what have we done in the last um, uh, 20, in the last few years since 2012? Um, so we joined up with CARE. Um, we held our first meeting at the American Society of Hematology. This is Dr. Van Rie and I. Um, from that first meeting where we got together 27 experts, we established a scientific advisory board um, to help to guide what we do. In 2014, siltuximab became the first FDA-approved drug for idiopathic multicellular calcium disease. Um, that same year, we launched what we call our International Research Agenda, which lays out all of the research studies um, that need to be done around the world for Castle disease, and we push forward every single one of those um, as fast as we can. Um, that same year, we also published a new model for how we think about Castle Rather than thinking about it as a lymph node disorder, we think about it as an immune system disorder. We'll get, get to that a little bit later. Um, and then in 2016, we published uh, the largest study ever of a new subtype of Castle which I'll be sharing with you guys about in a little bit. Um, we launched the Accelerate Registry in 2016. Um, hopefully all of you guys have heard about it. Um, you'll hear more about it today. It's, it's our best shot to figure out the right treatments for Castleman disease. It's when we pull together data from hundreds of patients to try to understand what patients are responding to what drugs, so we can find trends around the most effective treatments. And also in 2016, we got our first ever um, unique code for Castleman disease. It's D47.Z2. You guys should see it on all of your um, all of your uh, medical records, this new code. Before there was not a code for Castleman disease, we got the same code as a bunch of other immune system disorders. We didn't have our own unique code. Now we have our own unique code, and we spent a lot of time trying to get it because, one, it helps to make sure you guys get the drugs you need. When you have your own code, insurance companies are much more quickly to say that code can get that drug. So it helps to get access for all of us. And then importantly, it also helps with research. Now we can look in large databases and say, who has, D, who has the code D47.C2? And then we can do research on those cases. Um, in 2017, we published the first ever diagnostic criteria for calcium or idiopathic MCD. If you were diagnosed before 2017, before March of 2017, um, then your doctor made that diagnosis based on um, them having an idea for what it's supposed to look like, but not actually having a checklist or guidelines for this is how you make a diagnosis. Um, and so, but since March of 2017, there's now guidelines on this is how you diagnose idiopathic and lymph node calcium disease. Um, last year, the first ever NIH grant was awarded for idiopathic and lymph node calcium disease. Um, that that uh, funding's come here to the University of Pennsylvania um, to study IMC more directly and also to include a clinical trial of the drug serolimus um, that was mentioned a little bit earlier in the video. Also in 2017, and we begin to identify individual families where there are multiple patients within the same family with Castle disease. We begin doing genetic studies on those patients and those families to see if we can figure out what's underlying and what may be causing the Castle in those patients. Um, also in 2017, we had a couple of major studies that we started working on as early as 2014 um, that began to have readouts on their data. Um, so we didn't find a, a, a virus causing the disease. We did find increased activate, activity of a few different cell types and signaling pathways. That's when we'll go through that a bit more detail later today. Um, we also had a really important study published at the beginning of this year called the SPEED-1 study. Um, I mentioned earlier interleukin-6, and for a while we've suspected that the, the interleukin-6 is not the whole story for Castleman's, that there are likely other things involved, and we did find Instead of measuring just interleukin-6, we measured 1,100 different proteins in the blood of patients. And we ended up finding a number of things that other than interleukin-6 that were very high in Castleman's and actually much higher than interleukin-6. Um, in fact, a number of proteins called chemokines, and that got published earlier this year. Um, we also got our 100th patient into the Accelerate Registry. Now that we're over 100 patients, our goal is to get to 500 patients in the first five years. We're right on track for that. But the reason 100 patients is really exciting is by the time we get to 100 patients, we can start to see trends within the data. Are there certain drugs that work better for some type of patients than others? Are there certain laboratory tests that are better predicting if you might relapse again? Really meaningful things. Again, we're not just doing the research to, to learn about it. We, we don't care about learning about calcium disease. We care about figuring out what's the right drug, what's the right diagnostic test. And the only way to do that is with all this data. Um, in addition, we published a paper, uh, or just it was accepted a couple months ago, um, where we uh, looked at um, laboratory tests before patients are given sultuximab to see if there are certain tests that are elevated that could give you um, an idea that someone might be more likely or less likely to respond to sultuximab. So you can start saying, oh, based on your lab tests, 
you have a high likelihood of responding to siltuximab or based on your lab test, you actually have a low likelihood that this is going to work for you. And that's really important for, for guiding and personalizing therapy. And then really recently, this is hot off the press. It's actually not even on the press. Um, you guys should have gotten it in your packet. Um, but the, the top hematology journal in the world, which is called Blood, um, it's read by every hematologist worldwide, which is where our diagnostic criteria is published. They just accepted the first ever treatment guidelines for idiopathic multicentric calcium disease, which was an incredible two plus year effort that Dr. Van Rie helped to lead. And it is just amazing um, that this is finally out there. So you actually would have gotten in your packet, um, it says on it like do not distribute because technically it's not been published yet, um, but it's been, it was just accepted like a week and a half ago. It'll, it'll actually be out in press the next couple months, but it's actual treatment guidelines based on data from over 300 patients, based on discussions that Dr. Van Rie led with over 40 international experts from all over the world. So this is really exciting that there's finally treatment guidelines. It's one thing to say, okay, we can diagnose that that's important, but now let's say, what are the steps to, to more effectively treating idiopathic MCD? So a lot of progress. So I had to like really spread out the timeline just for the last couple of years because there's a lot that's going on right now. Um, and then also this year we launched our uh, biobank, which we call CASP. And then you can see some of the numbers below, the number of patients in our community and also physicians and researchers in our database. I'm going to skip through all this. This is basically saying, like, we made a lot of progress in the last six years. Um, we've got a bunch of people working together, and, and we really are, are, are fighting really hard um, for you guys. So um, I just want to click on this really quick um, so you guys see. Um, we, it's a little unique for organizations, but just to be as transparent as possible, we have a central place on our website where everyone in the world can see exactly what research we're doing. Um, so if you go to csa.org slash research pipeline, um, which you can find in the drop down for research pipeline here on our website, you can see what are the, the four major research questions that we're trying to answer. You can read about each of them. Um, you can read about the approach that we take to research. Um, and then most importantly, you can read about each of the studies that we're doing and you can see how far along the pipeline we are. So in this case, you can see that we're at step seven with the Hunt study. And you can learn about each of the studies. You can also see which studies you might want to um, contribute a sample towards or provide a donation to make it happen. Um, but it's just a really, really great way to see a full listing of all of our studies. And it is um, just incredible um, the number of studies we've been able to launch in the last few years. And as these continue to read out, we're going to continue to be able to improve um, the care uh, that is able to be provided to calcium patients. So definitely encourage you guys to check that out. Um, all right, so we're going to transition into the next piece of the talk. Sheila's keeping me on track. Um, so we're, we're doing good at the time. Um, before um, we go into overview of Castleman, is any questions about updates on um, Castleman's and kind of this, the field and where things are headed? Sure, yeah. Um, are, are you guys going into the lines of being with this microphone or is that the kind of field that you're hoping to come to? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. It's asking whether we think Castleman disease is a genetic disorder. So we know that for the vast majority, I would say higher than 95% of patients, it is not inherited. There's not a patient who inherits it from, from a loved one. We know that the vast majority, there's not two people in the same family with the disease. So um, it's not, that's what's considered what's called a Mendelian inherited disorder. We know it's not that. But what we are interested in understanding is even if it's not inherited parent to child, are there certain things in your genome that maybe predispose you to Castle disease? Are there, are there changes in your genetic material that can help us to explain why Castle happens? And if that's the case, that can help to better improve treatments. So we're doing the genetic, we're studying the genetics not because we think that we're going to find out that you can pass something on to your child or, or, or something like that. Because we know pretty well that that doesn't typically happen. It, it, happens occasionally and we know of those we know of a few of those cases. Um, but for the vast majority it doesn't go parent to child. So the genetics we're doing is just trying to figure out more about how the disease works so we can better treat it. Any other questions? So for those who participate in that study, if it was found that it was genetic, would we have been told? That's a great question. So one of the studies um, our Castle Genome Project, um, uh, which was done in New York, was doing, looking at whole um, genomes, which is the genetic material from 16 different patients. 
Um, and actually, the principal investigator of that, Minji, is going to be giving a talk later on today. Um, and you'll learn about a couple of variants that she found in her research. Um, thus far, I don't know if I can say with total confidence, but from her 16 patients, um, it doesn't look like there's a single variant that's across everyone that can say this is the Castleman's variant. Um, I don't want to give away her punchline, but I, I don't think that um, from the last time I spoke to her, I don't think she's going to share that today. Um, so it wasn't as clear as like we found it, um, but we did find a couple of variants within patients. It's a great question. Someone online had a, had a question. Um, they wanted to know what research is being done relating to HHV8 positive Castleman's. So there is an entire um, lab and research program at the NIH uh, led by Bob Yarshuin, which um, Tom Waldrick used to be the deputy director of. Tom's now in Seattle. But Bob Yarshman uh, leads an entire program almost called HHV Associated Malignancy Experience. And it is incredible. They have been doing work there for about 15, maybe 20 years. And they are the reason that there is a drug, rituximab, that works for some, or that we know rituximab works for these patients. They have a number of research protocols going on. And any patient that has HHV positive MCD, if you can get to Bethesda and if they're able to accept you, um, because the NIH can't accept everyone, if they're able to accept you, that's where you, you want to go to. David, do you, you agree with that? You, you, you want to go there. They, they, are, they are an incredible program. And so we work really closely with Bob. And, and we used to work really closely with Tom, but Tom's no longer there. Or we still work closely with him, but, but now he's in Seattle. All right, we're going to jump into the overview of Castleman disease. So um, I just want to start off with a really basic step. Earlier I said that before Castleman disease was thought of as a lymph node disorder, and now we really think about it as an immune system disorder. And that's really important. Um, that distinction is really, really important, and it really changes the way we think about the disease. Um, and so we think about it as an immune system disorder, and I'll explain that to you now. Um, so what does the immune system do? The immune system is there to protect you from viruses, to protect you from the outside environment causing problems. You've got different immune cells all throughout your body. They all have different roles. They're kind of all in a surveillance mode until they see something that can become activated. Um, so if they see something like bacteria or virus, those immune cells become activated to take on and fight those things. Um, they fight the viruses. And also, the immune system is really good at fighting cancer. And so um, some patients will actually develop cancer, and their immune system will kill and, and control the cancer. And you may never even know that you had cancer because your immune system destroyed it. Um, so the immune system is there to fight off foreign invaders and internal problems like cancer. Um, the idea is that it becomes activated, it takes on um, the, the thing that it needs to fight, and then it should go back into an inactive mode. This is kind of how the immune system is supposed to work. Be inactive, turn on when it needs to, and then turn off when it needs to. So, and one thing that's really important is the lymph node is the primary hub of the immune system. It's where this gets coordinated. It's where immune cells can talk to other immune cells and say, I've just seen this, you need to fight that. And to communicate with one another. Of course, they don't speak, they, they secrete cytokines. And these cytokines are the way they communicate. If they release IL-6, that tells a cell this. And it releases IL-4, it tells a cell something else. And so these cytokines help to communicate um, with one another about what's going on. And so again, just using another analogy, I think I used this last year for folks over here. The, the firefighter analogy, you can think about it as firefighters are kind of always in, in surveillance mode, waiting to hear about a fire like the immune system. Um, a fire starts somewhere, and the firefighters all run to put out that fire. Um, they put out the fire, um, with the, and they try to not cause too much damage beyond the fire. You know, don't want to spray water in too many other places. They, they control the fire, just like the immune system controls the virus or the cancer. And then then they return back to surveillance modes. The firefighters go back to the, their firehouse. Um, the immune system goes back to the door and say, that's how the immune system is supposed to work. And the analogy for Castleman disease you can think about is that you have the same sort of thing, these immune cells in this watchful mode. And for some reason, we don't know what the trigger is, but for some reason, um, the firefighters go into action. They get into to fighting mode, and they start you know, in this case, the example is that there's a false alarm, and they're, they're spraying water in buildings where there is no fire. And the equivalent in, in the body is that the, the good things, like your organs, your liver, your kidneys, your bone marrow, your heart, your lungs, actually start taking on damage because the immune system is on. Um, and so we don't know why it does that, and then unfortunately in Castleman disease, it's progressive. So unless you treat it, 
you can't stop it. And so, um, so the equivalent is, you know, cities flood, houses are destroyed, and, and you know, this is this is the equivalent of chaos. And so, so the questions we have is we want to figure out what is that trigger, what's causing the immune system to go go out of whack, and then how do you stop it? That's really that's really the most important. When you think about the immune system, there has to be this balance between if you have too weak of an immune system, then you get infections and you get really sick from viruses and colds. Um, whereas if your immune system is too strong, then your immune system actually causes problems. And so you really want balance within the immune system. And unfortunately, calcium is more on the too strong side of things. Um, and so then just to use this to show kind of a similar sort of story, but the idea in calcium in idiopathic MCD is that there's some sort of cause that turns on the immune system. And there are a bunch of different immune cell types. These are just a few of the hundreds of cell types. Um, and there's each of those cells has really intricate what are called pathways. And these are just um, communication lines within cells and between cells that turn on, which produce these cytokines, which cause damage. And then you end up with what we call viopathic multicenter calcium disease. So you know, all the symptoms and, and features that you see. So the research we're doing is trying to say, what's the cause? What are the key cell types involved? What's going on in those cells? Um, and then most importantly, how do we treat the disease? This is really how we think about our research. So earlier I showed you this slide. Um, I'm just going to hone in really quickly on idiopathic MCD and say that not only are there those three groups, but actually more recently we even break that third group up even further. Um, and so we have subgroups within subgroups, and some of us have a rare form of a rare disease and a rare subtype. Um, but what we found is that within idiopathic multicenter calcium disease, um, there's a huge spectrum. So uh, some patients um, will present with flu-like symptoms and will never be hospitalized with their idiopathic multicenter calcium disease. They'll have a form of the disease that really looks very different um, from the form that, that maybe I presented with, where I presented and had to go right into the hospital and go right into the intensive care unit. So there's this huge spectrum, um, all within idiopathic MCD, but, but really um, quite different. So some of these patients are going to be, it's going to be life-threatening, whereas others it's going to be more of a chronic illness. And a lot of that has to do with how quickly were you treated, what treatments were you given, um, a lot of factors. But we break up idiopathic MCD into one subtype that's called the TAFRA subtype. Um, so TAFRA is an acronym. Um, the stands for thrombocytopenia, which is low platelets, anisarca, which means lots of fluid, uh, fevers or inflammation, um, so this is the F. The R is for renal dysfunction, which is kidney dysfunction, um, also uh, fibrosis in the bone marrow, and the O stands for enlarged liver and spleen. Um, many of these patients uh, have the highland vascular, the hypervascular features in their lymph nodes, um, and this group is, is often the most severe, so they get the sickest the quickest. Um, and the reason that it's important, that we think it's important to split out TAFRO um, is that these cases just look different clinically than a lot of patients, uh, than other patients that have had an MCD. Uh, and so, for example, I'm a TAFRO patient, and there's other patients in the room that are TAFRO subtype patients. Um, another subtype is what's called POEM syndrome subtype of idiopathic MCD. Um, POEMS uh, stands for polyneuropathy, that's the P, or organomegaly, um, E for endocrine disorders, M for monoclonal plasma cell or monoclonal protein, and then S for skin changes. Um, the reason it's important to pull POEM syndrome subtype out is that you really should focus on treating the POEM syndrome um, and less focus on the Castleman's. Really, the Castleman's is a result of the POEM syndrome. So just how you can think about <coughs> In HHV positive MCD, the virus causes the multicenter calcium disease. In this group, it's the cancerous pollen cells that are causing the multicenter calcium disease. So you really want to treat the pollens. And then lastly, um, we, we're calling this classical IMCD, which basically is the people who don't have Taffer syndrome and don't have Pohm's syndrome. It's, it's the rest of the IMCD people. But that really, this is kind of a more classical way that the disease was described. Um, where it's not quite as severe, there are fewer hospitalizations, patients often have really high platelet counts, um, they have high IgG levels, um, and more plasma cells in their lymph node. Um, again, it's really important to separate these out because they look differently. Um, I was just on the phone with a doctor a couple weeks ago who was a patient that's very clearly TAFRA. Um, however, she has treated, almost all of the patients she's treated have a more classical IMCD appearance. So when I'm talking to her on the phone, she's saying, this patient got way too sick way too quickly to be an IMCD patient, because my patients usually um, present a little bit more slowly. And, and the response to that is, well, actually, there's an entire subgroup of an IMCD where it's really quick um, presentation. So it's important to, to do it from that perspective. And then also, we want to use this information to figure out what's the best drug for each of these subtypes. Um, 
And, and another thing I want to get across is that patients with IMCD um, tend to have consistent severity over the course of their disease. And, and we're trying to get to this with a registry. We need more data. We need more patients to be solid on this. But generally what we see is patients who present with a more mild presentation that don't need to be hospitalized up front are going to need to be hospitalized less frequently over time. Um, and patients that present really aggressively and they're in the ICU up front, those patients when they relapse, they're going to present in a more aggressive fashion. So um, the disease is heterogeneous across patients, but within a patient, patients generally tend to stay within uh, the sort of intensity with each of their relapses. Um, and I think that's, that's just important for people to, to keep in mind. Um, and we'll go through this later on with Dr. Van Reed, but these are some of the symptoms that you see in calcium. It's like symptoms, inflammatory markers, liver dysfunction, um, high platelets or low platelets, enlarged lymph nodes that have these particular features, um, issues with kidneys, fluid accumulation, um, low red blood cell counts, and then you can also have what's called a hypergamoglobin. So I said earlier that calcium and disease, the thing that unifies us is that if we cut out our lymph nodes and we look at them under the microscope, they look very, very similar. That's the one thing that unifies us. Beyond the way our lymph nodes look, there's actually a lot of differences. Well, we have similar looking lymph nodes under the microscope. And I'm not going to go in depth on, on what these features are, but these are some of the, the main features that you see um, in a calcium disease lymph node. Um, and, and your doctor will need to have seen them in order to make the diagnosis. Um, now, the question of, of what subtype you are, your histopathological subtype, it's not too clear to us how valuable or important it is to know if someone is the hyaline vascular or the plasmacytic or the mixed hist histopathological subtype. What's really most important is are you idiopathic MCD, are you UCD, are you HHV positive MCD? And if you're idiopathic MCD, what's your clinical subtype is probably, and we need more data to prove this, but it's probably more important to know what your clinical subtype than it is to know what is your link going to look like within this spectrum of features. But one thing I really want to get across is that I was really frustrated early on with how long it took for me to get diagnosed. I mentioned on the video 11 weeks, and I was read my last rites 11 weeks and two days after my diagnosis. So if it had taken 12 weeks, I would not have survived. I would have died. So 11 weeks was the longest it possibly could have taken for my diagnosis. And I was really frustrated. I thought that took way too long. Um, but what I've learned as I've studied this disease more is that Diagnosing is actually really challenging, even with our diagnostic criteria, because the features you look for in the lymph node, it's not black and white where it's like, this is a Kalsman's lymph node, this is not a Kalsman's lymph node. There are changes in features within the lymph node that make you say, oh, this looks like it's Kalsman disease, but they're subtle changes. And so the reason I wanted, what I want to show here is, so these are really classic features that look like Kalsman's, and then this is a totally normal lymph node. And, and, and they look kind of the same, right? And there, there's subtle changes in here that, that a pathologist would be able to point out. But the point here is that it's, it's not black and white, that there's that there are subtle changes that we're looking for. Um, and so so I have to be, uh, you know, take it a little bit easier on, on those early doctors. Um, so, but much is still unknown about this disease. Um, we're improving diagnosis, and, and, and the idea is we want to answer these four questions so that we can get better treatments for patients. And then again, just to highlight what we're doing from a research perspective, so we want to know what's the trigger. We want to know which immune cells are responsible for triggering it. We want to know what's going on in those cells. We want to know what those cells are doing, like producing IL-6. Most importantly, what therapies can stop it. Because the only reason we care about all these is to figure out this. Um, and then lastly, you need to have research infrastructure in place, like a biobank and a registry, to be able to do all this research. 